The next talk is on new and emerging treatments for lymphedema. I hope I can tell you optimistically that these are many. Uh, so I'm going to limit my comments to my own personal work because that's where I have the familiarity uh, with the emerging data. I will say that over the last decade, uh, there was a lot of excitement for the, the discovery of the growth factors associated with lymphatic development and the thought that these could be harnessed in some way to bring about new growth of lymphatic channels. Uh, similar excitement was present in the blood vascular world for angiogenesis. This is an example of uh, therapeutic lymphangiogenesis in the mouse tail model that I work in, uh, typically a whole mount, so you can see these newly developed uh, channels that have been stimulated through growth factors. This probably isn't going to be the answer, and as we've learned in many angiogenic contexts, when you simply apply a growth factor in a discriminate way, indiscriminate way, you're just going to get growth of capillaries that don't really function in an organized uh, fashion. But one of the areas that I've been involved in, which is a kind of an application of lymphangiogenesis to a surgical therapy, is autologous lymph node transfer, which many of you know is gaining increasing utilization in the realm of acquired and even primary lymphedema. The concept is that perhaps at the time of breast reconstruction or independently, a flap can be created that contains a lymph node that can be microsurgically implanted uh, into the lymphedematous limb to serve two purposes. Number one, obviously to increase the lymphatic nodal burden of the limb itself, but number two, to serve as an endogenous source of critical growth factors that can orchestrate a meaningful uh, um, vascular response. The problem with this surgery is that when it's successful, it's wonderful, but it's successful perhaps only 30 to 50 percent of the time. And we've learned through animal model studies that when it's not successful, it's typically because although the lymph node is given a blood vascular supply, the afferent and efferent uh, lymphatic vessels have to grow in uh, by primary intent. And simply said, that doesn't happen rapidly enough in those half or more of cases in which, uh, in which uh, this surgery is not successful and the node simply dies. So, uh, and this is, uh, again, a, a, an animal model, a large animal model, to look at this phenomenon and show that when you augment the lymph node with growth factors to encourage those lymph vessels to grow in that there is better engraftment and better function. So we chose to apply this phenomenon to a very old surgical concept, which is that somehow you could replace the damaged lymphatic vessels by just putting new uh, structures there that would carry fluid by a wicking effect. So this was first done in 1908 when silk threads were surgically implanted to replace the lymph vessels. And that does work for a period of time. The, 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 the arm does decompress, but eventually there's abscess formation, infection, and of course this is a foreign body that is not well tolerated by the human organism. A similar approach was tried about 75 years later when the investigators used multifilament Teflon, thinking that maybe it was the lumen that was going to be the issue, but again, short-term benefit, long-term failure because of the, uh, the structural issues. What we have attempted to do is to use or to create a multiluminal collagen thread that is a biologically normal material that will invoke endogenous lymphangiogenesis in a rapid fashion. And we call this the BioBridge. So this is what the BioBridge looks like uh, to the naked eye. You would think of it as a piece of suture, perhaps. That's about its size. But this is made of mammalian collagen from which the telopeptides have been cleaved, so there's no immunogenicity. This is the same material that people get injected for cosmetic surgery, uh, that mesh implants are put in at the time of hernia repair, and these uh, predicate devices have been used for over 30 years in human medicine. But we have post-processed the collagen to highly align the fibrils in one direction so that we create a, an ideal environment for lymphatic growth. And basically what we found is that when you put the scaffolds in tissue culture with lymphatic endothelial cells, they line up exactly as they might look inside the lining of a blood vessel or a lymphatic. So these are actually lymphatic endothelial cells that have distributed themselves in a biological manner across the scaffold. This is another view of it under the electron microscope and proof that these are in fact lymphatic endothelial cells.
We used, again, the large pig uh, model to uh, look at the efficacy of the BioBridge scaffold in a model of post-mastectomy lymphedema in which we remove the lymph node, we irradiate the area. Once the lymphedema develops, we go back in, and in this case, we simply implanted the collagen fibers surgically. And what we were able to find is that by CT imaging, we had clear regeneration of lymphatic collectors along the path of the BioBridge scaffolds that we had implanted. This is under a slightly higher power. And when we look under the microscope, you can see this is what remains of the BioBridge scaffold, the, the dark pink uh, linear structures. All of this is resorbed within about a six month period of time, but what's left behind are these newly formed lymphatic collectors that grow very avidly across the BioBridge, and here we've shown by immunohistochemistry that these are indeed lymphatic collectors because the endothelial cells stain for LIV1 and the smooth muscle cells stain for, with smooth muscle actin. What we are doing right now at Stanford is uh, we have a phase two uh, study under the FDA in which we are using the BioBridge scaffold adjunctively with autologous lymph node transfer versus autologous lymph node transfer alone and hoping to demonstrate that we vastly increase the, uh, the outcome potential of the lymph node uh, transfer. The goal, of course, is to make the patient garment independent, and we'll be studying this by quantitative lymphocentigraphy, by direct study of the skin tissues, as well as by a number of uh, in vivo clinical uh, measures of resolution of edema. So as I've shown before, um, unresolved lymphedema has all these tremendous consequences based upon the structural alterations uh, in the disease. Uh, I work, as I said, predominantly in a mouse model of lymphedema where we create the lymphedema surgically. And we use this because um, the skin is actually the end organ of damage in lymphedema, and the, hu and the human skin and the mouse skin strongly resemble one another as they do uh, when lymphedema supervenes with overgrowth of the dermis and the epidermis, inflammatory cell infiltration, microvascular dilation. In our model, we can even occasionally, by accident, uh, catch one of these uh, nice valves in cross-section. Um, we work in the mouse tail, which has a beautiful honeycomb distribution of lymphatic capillaries, and this, in essence, is a lymphocentogram of the mouse tail. This is what the tail looks like after we create the lymphedema. We simply transect the full thickness of the skin and ablate the lymphatic vessels that run on either side of the tail, and within about 14 days, the tail has a well-established edema. We've established a method whereby we can very accurately measure the volume of the tails, and then we can track the natural history of the disease. These are a reconstitution of the uh, histological images uh, of the tail at various time points in the model. By day 14 to 20, we have a maximal edema that resembles stage one lymphedema in the human, and as we progress, we eventually lose some of the edema component, but the structural alterations remain, so very much like stage two and stage three. Uh, initially, we were interested to see what is the skin doing when we create this model, and we did a technique called whole transcriptional, uh, whole uh, genome transcriptional profiling to look at what the expression patterns were in lymphedema skin compared to normal, and we're quite surprised to find that out of 50,000 genes that we assayed, only about 600 were differentially upregulated, and they almost all relate to inflammation and immune function, which was a big signal to us. We we then uh, went about uh, testing this model with an attempt to reverse the, the inflammation systemically. And to make a long story short, if we take a mouse that has this kind of lymphedema, big thickening of the dermis and the subdermis, and we expo expose the mouse to a very specifically chosen non-steroidal anti-inflammatory for 14 days, the skin architecture returns entirely to normal or effectively to normal. Here you see the normal on the right-hand side. So basically, lymphedema is an inflammatory disease that can be treated through systemic anti-inflammatory approaches. In fact, we were able to show that the big dilated lymphatic channels that are the hallmark of untreated lymphedema completely disappear when we simply give the anti-inflammatory therapy, so strongly resembling the pattern in normal. 
So we took this to the clinical arena. We repurposed a drug that has very specific anti-inflammatory uh, properties. And uh, basically, we studied about 120 patients in the study that is now completed and is being uh, written up for uh, publication this fall. Uh, and basically, we chose to follow clinically what we thought was a surrogate to what we were seeing in the mice, which is to look at the minimal thickness of the skin that could be distended by a caliper. So here is one participant prior to treatment with arm lymphedema, about 35 millimeters uh, minimal skin thickness, normal would be about two. And by the end of treatment, this patient with no other change in therapy other than the systemic oral anti-inflammatory had a reduction down to about three to four millimeters. On average, we saw that the treated patients reduced their skin thickness by about 20 millimeters, no effect in the placebo-treated cohort. Uh, I want to show you what's happening in the skin histologically to account for this. I've taken the section of skin that we took pre- and post-treatment and post-processed it in Photoshop, making all the white areas black so your eye can accommodate. And you'll notice that in pre-treatment, most of the section is, or let's say 50% of it, is black, meaning it's the fluid within the interstitium surrounding these thickened collagen fibers. And after four months of treatment, you can see that the preponderant amount of black has disappeared. That's really what's happening to make the skin more elastic and more normal. We found that the dermal epidermal thickness significantly reduced compared to the normal skin on the contralateral side. The thickness of the deep dermal collagen reduced to a very dramatic degree compared to what we measured in the normal skin. And to date, as I said, we've treated about 120 uh, patients. We saw about a 97% clinical response rate, and 100% of the patients elected to remain for some extended period of time on open-label continued use of the drug thereafter. So with that, we went back to the mouse model and asked ourselves, well, is this just some nonspecific anti-inflammatory effect? Can we use aspirin? Can we use anything we can pull off the shelf? And the answer is no. So we used a, non, a specific non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that has distinct properties uh, and were able to get the tails to, restrict, uh, to shrink down to normal. But when we used ibuprofen, which has a lot of chemical similarity to the drug that we used, it had no effect or sometimes made the tails worse. It allowed us to do a series of experiments that I don't have time to talk about today, but that's also in preparation for publication, where we were able to determine that the pathway that was being influenced by our drug was a pathway of leukotriene anti-inflammatory molecules, and specifically the causative agent appears to be leukotriene B4. We have subsequently uh, discovered a drug that has a very targeted action on this molecule. We've imported it from Japan, where it's been used safely for 25 years in other clinical contexts. And we are currently uh, undertaking a placebo-controlled trial of the drug for the FDA, hopefully for release in the United States ultimately, in which we're going to be initially treating 45 patients, looking at a, a, a variety of endpoints compared to placebo. This is a proof of concept study to show that leukotriene B4 is the causative agent that can be reversed in uh, lymphedema. And uh, this is a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial uh, in which the patients will be treated for six months. We'll be treating adults with secondary edema, uh, lymphedema of the lower extremities uh, with ISL stage two or greater. They must have completed the standard physical therapy for lymphedema and be able to use a standard compression garment. Um, it's our hope one day that we will again be able to reverse all of these troubling cases of lymphedema, and I thank you very much for your attention.